Hello, guys. Uh, my name is Srini Upalapati. I'm a senior director uh, in the Consumer Bank Engineering team at Capital One. My talk today is called Serving Transactions Serverless. Um, for contextual reasons, the, the transactions I'm talking about is really the customer's financial transactions. One of my engineering teams in the transactions and cash flow lane is faced with the challenge of uh, dealing with transactional data on a hosted mainframe monolithic platform. And the challenge we had to face was how do we go about making those transactional data available in the cloud and make it available to all the channels such that our customers can conveniently service their accounts. So a little bit about Capital One. Uh, it's one of the 10 largest banks in terms of deposits. We have about 45 million customer accounts across various products that we have offer for our customers. And then we are available everywhere online. And from a bank perspective, we also have uh, branches as well as our signature cafes where our customers walk in to service their accounts. Um, on the retail bank side of the things, historically, the backend core platform has been a, a core monolithic mainframe system. And to make things more complicated, it's a hosted platform. And, uh, the high-level architecture in such kind of a setup looks something like this. So when we think about the various channels through which our customers can interact with us, there is a grouping of three uh, primary channels, the online web, the mobile platform, and also the bunch of software applications we have within branches where customers walk in to service their accounts. All these three channels end up integrating with a rich suite of APIs that we have built in-house in Capital One. And these APIs integrate with a SOAP layer, which in turn makes connections to the legacy monolithic mainframe system for doing reads of data, as well as you know, writing any information pertaining to customers' transactions. In many ways, this architecture diagram is very consistent with all financial institutions, in fact, across the whole globe. Starting in 2015, Capital One started investing uh, quite heavily in our mobile platform. And uh, we have heard some really awesome things from our customers in terms of how enjoyable the experience it has been for them to service their ac accounts on the mobile platform. Since 2015, we are seeing like a steady adoption of uh, new customers enrolling on our mobile app and continuing to use the app, both on Android and our iPhone platforms, to service their accounts. In conjunction with our really aggressive adoption of customer traffic on the mobile platform, we are also seeing that um, I have the good fortune uh, experience of working with a brilliant product team within Capital One, and they're coming up with new innovative ideas of actually presenting transactional data to our customers and then the engagement of our customers on the various channels in terms of accessing their transactional data is starting to pick up. And you know how uh, I'm trying to set up the context and stage in terms of how things are evolving uh, you know, when you think of uh, a large enterprise and a financial institution like Capital One. With the high adoption rate of customers followed by the new digital products we are offering, now we are starting to see that the legacy architecture we have in place is not performing as well we, as we would like. And our customers are letting us know. And we are starting to see slowness in terms of page load times, both on the web as well as our mobile platform. In 2016, um, Capital One as an engineering team has again started to invest really heavily in the DevOps space, adopting cloud technologies. Um, and within the consumer bank team, in my areas, I have now multiple applications that are continuously being deployed all the way into production. So we are truly embracing the immutable server patterns. Um, we use Jenkins, and, and we use test automations at every stage. And we are deploying multiple times during the day, uh, and which is kind of unheard of for a large financial institution. And we have some additional challenges in terms of ensuring that there is segregation of duties between engineer who commits the code and the actual person who clicks on the button affecting the code change to be deployed into production. We kind of accounted for all of that with seamless tooling in-house. And we are at a situation where right now many of the net new software assets, at least in the consumer bank space, 
we are exclusively continuously deploying in the cloud. Now, in the bottom half of the slide, you can kind of see the release cadence for a mainframe system, right? This is also very consistent in the industry. Now, we are starting to see that there is a definite friction when the new world and the new software assets in the cloud and the mechanism by which we are deploying them is starting to you know, cause friction with the way we move mainframe-related code changes from dev environment all the way to production. So it actually takes close to month, month and a half, largely because of the monolithic nature of the system. And for folks who have never worked in a bank, when I, when I refer like a large monolithic, just to give you some context, you're, you're talking about like vast amounts of customer information, account-related information, credits, debits, and all the critical backend processes that actually makes a bank as a responsible financial institution to be run, all of them happening on a you know, consistent set of hardware as one large monolithic piece of software. So every time any code changes need to be done, you're talking about tremendous amount of testing and manual testing before it can actually see the day of light in production. So basically what's happening is, because of this friction between the new world and the old world, we are starting to see a, a drastic impact in terms of our ability to ship code into the hands of our customers at a rapid pace. The other detail, which I do not have a slide that I want to share upon is like this monolithic mainframe system I'm talking about is a hosted solution. So the bank pays a pretty big check every year uh, to this particular vendor. And there are also issues where during holiday season or peak volume traffic, we do like see spikes in volume of traffic. And oftentimes we have seen reliability issues with the mainframe system and also its ability to auto scale to meet the needs of the growing needs of the customer at specific periods in the year is, is just not there. And if we have to scale, it, it translates into again investing in additional hardware in a hosted setup. So these are all the reasons which actually drove us to kick off an initiative called Transactions Hub. Um, and I'm going to kind of share more details around the journey towards leveraging serverless architecture. So, um, what did we decide to do? Um, we, we assembled together like a small cross-functional engineering team, a top-notch engineering talent, about eight engineers, and we gave them some specific uh, objectives, right? So first and foremost, we said, we're going to focus on the read traffic. The reason I'm saying is, uh, when you talk about a mainframe system, you have all the write traffic coming in, read traffic coming in. So since our focus is to ensure that the channels where we are presenting the transactional data performs well, we ensured that the team stays head on focused on solving the read traffic issue. And then we had some very specific deliverables in terms of holding the team accountable, and one of them being uh, security in the cloud, because we are a responsible bank and we are talking about customers' financial transactions, so it becomes very important that we are ensuring that the data is secure. The second thing is quality of the data. Um, what I, where I'm going with this thing is, there is zero tolerance when it comes to presenting transactional data, if there is issues with the quality. You know, you don't want inconsistent state when we are presenting the transactional data. And last but not the least, the performance of our architecture and target solution should definitely be much better than what it is on-prem because we have metrics which we know we want to do much better than. So using these as our driving factors, we set about our journey of actually uh, designing the transactions hub. If you look at the problem statement, uh, at a very high level, it can be broken down into few epics. Um, the first largest epic is, we are talking about millions of accounts. For um, compliance reasons, we have to maintain 18 months of transactional data per account. And it roughly translates into a you know, few billion transactions. Not an awful lot of records when you look at the number. But again, the sensitivity is around accurateness of the data and then uh, the, the security around the data. So we need a mechanism to migrate the data and make it available in the cloud uh, without missing a single transaction. So that was our first challenge. The second challenge closely tied to that is every night the mainframe system actually goes through a process where it posts all the transactions per the day. So we need a mechanism to kind of sync up the target data store with the nightly batch transaction posting that happens. The other big epic is we needed a queuing infrastructure to keep the source and the destination in sync. Uh, what I mean by that, if you envision a consumer bank, uh, our customers have debit cards and they use the debit card swipe at point of sale. They provision their debit cards in Apple Pay, Android Pay, they tap it at point of sale 
the deposit a check, ATM transactions, all of them have native connections to the mainframe systems through various you know, debit card processing networks. So all the writes happen on the mainframe system. And now we are talking about a mechanism, a queuing infrastructure to relay the events near real time such that we are able to sync the data in the cloud uh, in terms of source and destination being uh, accurate in terms of data quality. The last challenge uh, from an engineering perspective or the major epic on this is, I mentioned that we have a legacy API that retrieves data from the mainframe system. Now we need a new API in the cloud that integrates with the new data store in the cloud and presents the data back to the various channels. Now this is a little bit tricky given the number of channels uh, and the number of accounts and the fact that customers are actually using it. We are pretty much talking about changing the tires of a moving car in terms of converting the read traffic over to the newer set of architecture in the cloud. So those are our broad challenges that we had to solve for. So um, we, we choose a very industry tried technique with a CQRS pattern. That's our high level approach in terms of focusing on the read traffic. So you can see on the left hand side of the, of the architecture diagram, both the reads and writes were happening to the mainframe system. On the right hand side, we have taken an approach where all the read traffic gets segregated to the new infrastructure in the cloud through which the transactional data gets served to various channels. A quick architectural overview of the whole transaction hub solution. I'll kind of walk you through how we went about solving the three, four main epics that I just spoke about. On the farthest left hand side, you see the mainframe system. Uh, we ended up creating a process on the mainframe system to basically read all the data, transactional data, write them into files. You're talking about having to rely on subject matter experts who knew COBOL how to do it. We're talking about a legacy application like a decade old. And then we securely FTP those files to the S3 bucket in the cloud. The moment the file arrives in the S3 bucket, we actually send out an SNS notification and there is a Lambda function which is actually reacting to the SNS notification. The Lambda function ends up writing a record into the RDS data store, basically indicating the state of the file. And then we have a CloudWatch rule which triggers a second Lambda function which looks at the state of the records in the RDS database and it provisions a set of EC2 instances where we are running a Spring Batch application. Now this Spring Batch application ends up reaching out to the S3 bucket, reads the data in the file, and then invokes the public endpoint in DynamoDB to ingest the data into the data store in the cloud. In subsequent slides, I'll go into further details as to why we choose DynamoDB and our experiences of using it in an enterprise, et cetera. You can also see that the moment the batch job is successfully done, the Lambda function tears down the entire batch infrastructure. So again, one more example or pattern within leveraging the serverless architecture, we are actually destroying unneeded infrastructure and help save some money and resources for the bank. On the bottom portion, you can see that we also log all information and events to both CloudWatch as well as uh, Logstash. We use Elasticsearch as a business monitoring platform within the bank. And in subsequent slides, I will share some other details about the Kibana dashboards and what kind of monitoring we have in place, which becomes very crucial in a serverless architecture just so that we know what's going on. Um, on the right hand side, you see another EC2 instance next to the DynamoDB, that's where we actually deploy and host the new API. The new API integrates with DynamoDB as our persistence layer, and then it presents the data back to our clients. So this, in nutshell, was our high level approach and architecture for the transaction hub in kind of helping us solve the broad high level epics that I just spoke about. A quick zoom in into the near real-time infrastructure um, in the previous architecture and the second slide, you, in the second portion of the diagram, I actually listed that. We took advantage of an existing MQ cluster setup to kind of relay the events from the mainframe system to DynamoDB in the cloud. For resiliency purposes, we have four queue managers. Each queue manager has a dedicated MQ listener in the cloud, which is essentially a Spring Boot application that is actually listening to the queue, picking up the transactional events. 
and then invoking DynamoDB's endpoint to ingest the data in the destination. So why did we choose DynamoDB as a data store? Um, given our uh, push within Capital One in terms of adopting cloud platform and leveraging cloud technologies, the single most thing that instantly grabbed our attention is the fact that it's a managed service. Um, it's a NoSQL data store from AWS. Second thing is it plays really well with a bunch of other tools within the AWS ecosystem, primarily DynamoDB, uh, primarily AWS Lambda and DB, DynamoDB streams, both of which we had a strong desire to use, as you'll see in the subsequent slides. Um, the last thing is you pay for what you use. And given our experience with the mainframe system and the amount of money we have spent, we were wanting to be consciously, you know, looking at the expenditure in terms of you know, how much we pay for the new data store. And not to mention the awesome response times when it comes to DynamoDB, because our focus was to really improve the, the, the response times from a read perspective. Now, there are few workarounds that we had to deal with, given we are a financial institution and, and some challenges with DynamoDB. So I'm going to talk about a few of them. First and foremost, DynamoDB does not support encryption at rest. Uh, this has been a long-term need of us, and we are closely working with AWS on that. But what this really means is we ended up leveraging region-based KMS keys and client-side encryption libraries to custom encrypt the transactional data before we store it into DynamoDB. Now, the side effect of that is we cannot take advantage of the cross-region replication, and uptime of our systems is extremely important, especially when we talk about presenting customers' transactional data back to our customers. So we ended up creating the entire stack of accounts hub in the West region, and we start to use West region more in DR capacity. So all the files get FTP to both regions. Um, MQ infrastructure is there in both places. And so is the API. And in the West region, we leverage the KMS keys pertaining to the West region to encrypt the data and save it. Now it also means, and that this is something that we are aware that as and when DynamoDB makes native encryption available, we will have to re-ingest the data. We kind of knew that starting going forward. The other subtle detail is there are performance implications. Every time our custom code needs to do this encryption before storing it, uh, there is an impact to performance. And at the same time, the storage kind of increases um, when, we, when we talk about custom encrypting the actual data and then inserting into the database. The second interesting thing is around the public endpoint. Um, what happens with that is because we are a regulated environment, within Capital One VPC, we are forced to create now a web proxy layer through which our communication is happening to the public DynamoDB endpoint. Architecturally, not an ideal situation when you have your APIs and your persistence tier in between, you have a proxy. Performance-wise, an additional hop. And we know today that the uh, region, VPC-based DynamoDB endpoints are available in some regions. We are actually looking forward for its availability. We'll probably a few weeks away from it. The moment they're available, we will get rid of the uh, web proxy and instead directly leverage the VPC-based endpoints and ensure that the connection is secure. Before I get into the, uh, the expense side of the things, the other detail when we talk about dealing with a managed service is the fact that it's new territory for us as Capital One, as a large financial institutions, because we needed to get used to the incident alerting mechanism on AWS side and, and, uh, and, and kind of map that to what happens within Capital One in the event that something bad happens in production. And it took some learnings for us to kind of sync up with the way AWS resources support DynamoDB, et cetera. Now, without getting into many details, I'll just focus on one other uh, beauty about AWS Lambda function. In our entire usage pattern, we knew exactly when we would be performing right intensive actions, when we are like ingesting large volumes of batch data. And we also know the periods during the day when our read traffic is at its peak. Now, what that means is programmatically leveraging Lambda functions, we are able to dial up and dial down the read and write capacity units and provision the throughput exactly to meet the needs of our business. Now, because of this, you know, we are able to effectively manage the cost in comparison with uh, you know, actual usage for our customers. 
And at the back of our mind, we know that if there is a spike, we have the ability to dynamically increase the throughput and accordingly address the traffic needs of our customers. Now, I cannot share details about what we spent today, but comparatively, when you look at the annual run for this, we are talking about really, really like low amount of expenditure. I know it's a very relative term, but there is tremendous excitement in terms of the value add in terms of leveraging DynamoDB as our data store. I'm pleased to announce that Transactions Hub for the retail side of the world is live in production. Uh, thanks to the fantastic contributions from the engineering team, uh, and uh, we are now taking production traffic. We are halfway into migrating the read traffic. There are few channels still left to be done. Um, I'm sharing with you guys some of the performance results uh, in our performance region, and I'm extremely pleased to know that the response times are like around 50 milliseconds on an average which is terrific in relation to what's happening with the mainframe monolithic system. I briefly touched upon um, the business monitoring capabilities in one of the slides and leveraging Elasticsearch. Um, I mean, there is tremendous uh, buzz within Capital One in terms of in all our team areas, we have monitors and whether the teams are working on money movement related stuff or act transactions hub in this case, we have team area based monitors where we are continuing to monitor business metrics and things that our partners really care about. In this particular example, there are two dashboards that I'm sharing. On the left hand side is the average time it is taking to process uh, the batch files that we are receiving from, from the mainframe system. And as you can see, on an average, we are able to complete all ingestion in the times of nightly feeds coming from the mainframe system in less than 50 minutes. We also know on an average if any of those batch processing feeds have failed, we keep track of every record that actually has not successfully completed. And on the right hand side is similar Kibana dashboard indicating the way things are working with our near real time queuing infrastructure. We are able to successfully read and ingest um, millions of transactions all through the day. And we also know by hour where the peak volume is in terms of you know, real-time events coming in into DynamoDB. So on both sides, things are performing really well with, with DynamoDB as our data store. So operational alerts is the second thing which becomes extremely important, um, especially when you have components within an architecture which are serverless. I'm here sharing a few of those alerts, and we have many more uh, we couldn't capture on this screenshot. But basically, the focus was really on the EC2 instances where the APIs have been stood up. As you can see, we have operational alerts pertaining to CPU usage and memory usage, and all stakeholders, along with engineers, continuously receive these alerts. Now, I mentioned about Capital One's investments in DevOps as a, as a practice, and we are really taking it up a notch in 2017, uh, truly embracing YBYO culture. You build, you own it. And all the alerts that I have shared right now, we are starting to send the notifications across multiple channels, uh, definitely email and Slack. But more importantly, we are actually leveraging VictorOps. And people who are familiar with PagerDuty, VictorOps is something similar. And Engineers within the team now are receiving the alerts and they are taking the ownership and responsibility of production infrastructure. And given that we have full-fledged CI-CD pipelines, in the event they really need to fix or remediate something, we are able to act immediately and take care of things as they happen in the cloud. A quick summary of the various tools that I've kind of shared about. Um, I'm not going to review any of them, but we continue to depend, at least this solution, on a number of tools, most of them available within the AWS ecosystem. So what's next for us? Um, now that at least the transactional data perspective, we are able to kind of get the data and make it available in the cloud suddenly this opens the doors for a plethora of opportunities for us to execute upon, right? In many ways, the foundational infrastructure to solve some of the pain points is done, and now what lies ahead is tremendously exciting for us. 
So as an immediate priority, we are looking to basically rewrite some of our most popular transaction alerts, leveraging DynamoDB streams in real time. Now that the data is available in the cloud, we can stream the data and we have the opportunity to enrich each transactional data with merchant information and merchant logo as one example. We also have the ability to look at some of those transactional details and specifically alert our customers to meet their specific needs based on their usage of the debit card as an example, um, which is like very exciting to our product team. Now, we are starting to evaluate AWS step functions. Uh, it's still not an approved AWS service within Capital One, but I think the idea really is if you go back to my original architecture, we want to strip off that entire spring batch application and actually leverage the step functions to orchestrate exclusively Lambda functions to read and ingest the data into the cloud. So the development effort for that is in flight as I speak. Now, what else? There are a few other exciting details. I can't share all of them, but I'll touch upon a few of them. The most uh, exciting thing for me, at least, is now that this foundational architecture and approach works, we want to kind of expand that on the direct side of the bank to not only pull in transactions, we also want to start pulling in account-related information and start to thin down the dependency on the mainframe system and start to build our ecosystem in the cloud and microservices in the cloud wherever we can by leveraging serverless architecture. Um, more importantly, imagine like once this data, transactional data is available in the cloud that unleashes the capability for us to leverage machine learning capabilities on that data to provide awesome digital experience for our customers. Something like real-time fraud detection to prevent losses for our customers is starting to become a distinct possibility for us and we are very, very excited about that. That pretty much brings the end to my talk. Um, and before I stop anything, I just want to say a thing around, my team and I are having the time of our lives working in Capital One tremendous support from our business partners. Um, everybody around us wants to see us succeed as a technology company. We have real world problems affecting customers' financial lives uh, on our hand to solve for, the ability to exclusively use cloud technologies and platforms, and then more importantly, embracing the DevOps culture to continuously deploy code all around the day, uh, and thereby every engineer in my team is actually feeling very, very accomplished. So thank you so much for your time. And if any of you guys have any questions or want to know more what's happening within Capital One, please stop by at the booth. Uh, me and my engineering team is here, and we would be so happy to talk to you. Thank you so much.